how do you establish a coaching brand, marketing, and business strategies that best work for you? Welcome to the Coaching Revealed podcast series on the journey to coaching success. We'll dive into this question in today's episode. I'm one of your podcast hosts, Emily Tarani, and in this podcast episode, host Jeffrey Hall, Executive Director of the Institute of Coaching, interviews Tracy Duberman, a distinguished expert in the health coaching industry and founder of the Leadership Development Group. They discuss Tracy's professional journey, her business strategies, and her insights into leadership development within healthcare. Throughout her career, Tracy has been dedicated to the healthcare leadership space working in public health, clinical leadership, and administration. In establishing and cultivating a thriving organization, Tracy attributes much of the success to both personal and professional relationships. She's leaned into support from colleagues, friends, and families, while she's established relationship building as her most successful strategy for generating clients. In forming a brand and company, Tracy and Jeff discuss the importance of trying new things, finding what works best for you, and seeking out collaboration and expert advice to bounce ideas off of from people you trust. We close this episode with Jeffrey and Tracy discussing how to market a coaching business in 2024 and what might work well in this constantly changing ecosystem. Thank you for learning more about the coaching field with us at the Institute of Coaching in our podcast, Coaching Revealed. Let's get started. Well, hello everyone. And welcome back to Coaching Revealed, the coaching podcast from the Institute of Coaching. My name is Jeffrey Hull. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Coaching, and we are super excited to have you back for our third season. And we are thrilled to have one of our fellows from the Institute of Coaching joining us. Her name is Tracy Duberman. She's a PhD and has many other letters after her name but she is an expert and visionary and influential leader in the health coaching industry, the health industry in general. She is the founder, owner, and developer developer of her business called the Leadership Development Group. And she truly is an expert on how to build a business from the ground up that involves leadership development, coaching, all across her specialty area, which is the health ecosystem. So let me just give you a little bit more background on Tracy. So she's a certified professional executive coach herself. She's a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. She's a fellow of the Institute of Coaching, as I mentioned before, one of our thought leaders at the Institute. She applies evidence-based insights and best practices to design and deliver customized talent development solutions that align talent to strategy. She's also the author of a groundbreaking book called From Competition to Collaboration, How Leaders Cultivate Partnerships to Drive Value, Transform Health. And having worked with her closely, I can say that she's an inspiring leader who has really made a mark on the healthcare industry. So Mm -hmm. I am super thrilled to be here with you. And as I always like to start, Tracy, with these interviews, just to sort of step back before we get into your marketing expertise and your sales success, which we will, I'd like to just have you share a little bit about how it all came about. Well, I, Jeff, what a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. I, I really do not consider myself an expert, quote unquote, in uh, marketing or sales. But I will say that if I look over the lifetime or the trajectory of my own professional journey, I sort of fell into this. And I think that uh, it really came from my desire to help others and my strong value in building relationships. Um, So I think if you have those two core competencies, it may not feel as onerous to build a business in an industry that you're connected to. Uh, personally and professionally, and you work with people that you really enjoy, the rest of it comes pretty naturally. However, that being said, as I was preparing for this interview with you, I started to think about all of the strategies that we've put into place to actually develop and grow the business. And I'm happy to share those with anyone. And especially today here with you, um, Jeff, you've been a a friend and a, a colleague and uh, a faculty member for our firm. So happy to be able to, to to talk to you about that. Yeah. I mean, I've been privileged to actually work with you a number of times over the years. 
I have on, I don't know that I ever asked you the question, how did you get started in healthcare? I mean, because you did, everybody always has to sort of pick an area that they want to focus on, either a content focus or a industry focus. So tell us a little bit about how health, healthcare came to be your specialty. Sure, absolutely. Happy to share my journey. So I started out my career um, as a, I would say, a researcher within the healthcare industry. My academic background is in public health, and truth be told, I thought that I would be a professor or do uh, clinical research as a career for myself early on. You know, it's fortuitous a journey that we take, and you know, you have to look for opportunities and 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 kind of gravitate to the ones that really resonate for you. So for me, working in a hospital setting was something that I really enjoyed. I loved being surrounded by the clinicians, nurses, and physicians. And so early on in my career, I was doing a lot of work in operations and administration in healthcare. So I got to see frontline leaders doing the work of patient care and administrators supporting uh, the work of the clinicians. And I was fascinated. At the end of the day, there's very little attention being paid to developing the skills of those clinical leaders to be leaders themselves in the way in which they communicate all of the leadership behaviors that you and I talk to our clients about time and time again and help to coach them to be performers in that area. Instead, in an area where being a high professional like a clinician is what folks focus on in terms of their clinical um, academic experience, um, the need for coaching was something that I kind of saw early on. I was recruited into the Hay Group, which is now part of Corn Ferry, that I learned that there's a whole science behind building leadership capabilities. And I just fell in love with that area of expertise. Long story short, um, about midway through my career, I was in my, let's say, this was almost 15 years ago. So I was in my early 40s. I decided to combine my two areas of expertise, leadership development through my work with the Hay Group and, and others, and healthcare, which was my academic credentialing in healthcare, and I combined the two and opened up the leadership development group, wholly focused on developing executive physician, nurse, and other clinical leaders within various sectors of the healthcare industry. And I have to ask you, what was going through your mind when you decided instead of just being an executive coach, which you could, you are, and you could have gone that route, that you actually decided to found a company that was focused on even a broader set of services, including programming, development classes, or seminars, coaching, all of the above. Yeah. So I think um, I do love delivering the work. So I love being a coach and an OD consultant. So not only coaching, but team development, the design of performance management programs, succession planning, et cetera. Um, but the need is so great that no one individual can do it alone. So I started to team up with individual coaches and OD consultants, and I started to naturally gravitate towards the design of solutions, but I wasn't necessarily expert in the execution of those solutions. So I, I recognized that my lane was really, or my, I guess, sweet spot was really in listening to the clients, understanding what the challenges are that they're facing and designing the solution and bringing in the expert to refine the solution and ultimately execute on that with our clients. I love working with clients and listening and building. I am not the best executor on all things. That recognition kind of helped me in creating the firm. Wow. But were you ever fearful or anxious about actually being the founder of a firm that's going to offer that suite of services? I mean, you make it sound like it was such an easy decision because it's your sweet spot. But Yeah, I mean, not easy at all. I will tell you for those coaches out there that are thinking about opening a firm like this, I, thankfully, I had the support of, of family and friends to kind of cheer me on and um, make me feel as if I you know, could do this and had the confidence. My husband is an entrepreneur himself, so I learned a lot from him. And and um, he helped to lead the way. And then I was smart enough to take some really good advice early on from colleagues to say, let's help you by building an advisory board and bringing in people that could help you in building a business, whether it was financing, 
or marketing or depth of expertise within particular sectors of the industry that I wanted to be working in. So I, I had a lot of people behind me. I, you know, there's a lot of wind beneath the wings. Yeah, but it's funny. It, it circles right back to where you started, which is that you're highly relational, recognizing that even though you're the founder and you were the one that made the business come into fruition, you've been doing this in partnership with people all along. Ready to advance your coaching practice? Join the Institute of Coaching and tap into the world's leading resource for coaching science and professional development. With over 4,000 members across 130 countries, the IOC offers invaluable networking opportunities with an elite global coaching community and innovative learning to broaden your knowledge and keep you at the forefront of coaching best practices. Engaging cutting edge learning events with world renowned coaching scholars, from webinars and seminars to discussion groups, research projects, and more. Try any membership free for 30 days. Use promo code IOC podcast and visit instituteofcoaching.org backslash join to get started. All along, which is, you know, interestingly enough, the, the, the title of the book that you mentioned is From Competition to Collaboration. How much more can get done through collaborative partnerships as opposed to competing against one another. And in the work that we do in particular, which is leadership development, in particular within healthcare, it, you've got to be collaborative in the way you do your work. Um, it, there, there's so much work to go around um, and no individual can do it alone. So once you have that recognition and you open yourself up to the possibilities, you could really go far. Let's switch gears then and talk a little bit about how you have built the business because it's been quite a success. I mean, you have a team, you do programs all across the U.S. I know I was involved in New York pro programs and you do them in Texas and California and Massachusetts. And how did that all come about? When we started 15 years ago, it was myself and Lisa Clark, who you well know. She started out with me as my right-hand person, the administrative assistant for TLD Group. And now she's the vice president of coaching operations. Um, but it was Lisa and I, and we started uh, pretty slow. I think, you know, our first year we were maybe like sub 200,000 in, in revenue. And, you know, now we're multi millions of dollars in revenue um, year over year, which is lovely. It was a slow and steady build for me having, um, worked within all of the primary sectors of healthcare. So I had operational experience in health systems within the New York area, national insurance companies, as well as international pharmaceutical companies. I was building relationships, un unbeknownst to me that I would ultimately open up a business, but I was building relationships all along. Through my work at the Hay Group, I learned how to really build client relationships as it relates to new business development. And that's really about pounding the pavement, picking up the phone, you know, doing really good work and then advertising that work. You know, this is pre-social media. So a lot of letter writing and mailing of those letters to companies, meeting with, with potential clients, being of service even well before you actually sign a contract to do the work. It's, it really is a slow and steady build. And if you've got the patience and the, you know, the grit to kind of get through that, you do start to see the fruits of your labor. Um, and now, because we're now in business for over 15 years, 16 years this year, most of our client, clients, I would say 90% are through referrals. So you do really good work. Um, and you are referred for work in other organizations and that, and then we just continue to do really high quality work. I think one of our mottos is that we are very high touch. You know, clearly at at its core, your success is built on the fact that you're so relationship oriented and that you actually believe in sort of developing connections, proving this, the quality of your deliverable, making sure that you're working with a collaborative team. I mean, I think that those things are all a representative of who you are as a leader, and clearly that plays into your success. But along the way, you mentioned starting out earlier, you know, even before you said social media and you were writing and sending out letters and doing things. And now if you jump up to today, everybody is on LinkedIn and trying to do Instagram and all these things. And I just love to hear the insights of someone who has built a business, marketing, business development, relationship building, but you've also used some level of marketing collateral 
and sales techniques. And, you know, what do you find really works? What do you, what do you look to as the core of your success when you think about broadening the business? Yeah. So, so I will say the story's not written yet on the new techniques marketing. So I, we, we are constantly like every year we've got a strategy that we put into place around marketing and new business development. And we then evaluate the success of it. And it, it's really hard to get quantifiable metrics of success for most of the new types of marketing strategies. So all of that being said, what, what I will say is that while referrals and existing clients are central to our success as a business, we are constantly exploring different marketing avenues to try to expand our branding and to hopefully drive growth within the organization. Some of the things that we're doing currently, and I would, I would recommend that coaches that are starting their businesses or trying to expand their businesses, you know, think about these types of strategies because we're doing them right now. One is um, around content marketing. So um, I spend a great deal of time writing blogs, writing articles. We work with our faculty in creating case studies. And these are ways in which we can showcase our expertise. We share those on our personal LinkedIn pages. We share them on our company LinkedIn pages. We have um, relationships with editors at industry magazines and publications like Healthcare Executive, uh, Physician Leadership Journal. There's a lot of uh, online publications that we that we submit to. Don't always get accepted, but we submit to. Um, and when you can get picked up, you can. And I don't, I, I'm not an expert in marketing, but apparently, you know, it gets picked up, you get ranked higher in Google. And when people search for executive coaching, they'll hopefully come across your name. So you'll have to talk to a real expert about how that works, but that's what we're trying to do with our content marketing. I think it's really important for us. And I have a research background as do you. So I, I think right. that actually sharing your experience um, and being able to quantify the work that you do in a way that actually showcases the metrics of your success in some way is really important as you talk about the work that you do. So whether it's for the purposes of branding or it's for the purposes of talking to clients that you're currently doing work with, I think it's really important to do. I remember when I first started working with you, which goes back quite a long way, you know, I was relatively new to working in the healthcare space at that time. And I remember working with physicians Yes. is particularly important to be credible. I mean, they are highly educated, highly analytical. They don't really tolerate a lot of BS. They're not going to put up with it if you don't really have enough knowledge. You don't have to know what they do. You don't have to have surgical skills or you don't have to be an anesthesia expert, but you do have to be um, credible in their mind. When I think of working with you and your firm, one of the things that you do in your collateral, the materials that you write about in the case studies, is that you put out information that builds that level of credibility. And given your target audience, it makes a difference. Yeah. So I remember when I first started the business, Jeff, there were um, one of my advisors said, <laughs> he sent me an email and it just had three words in it. It said, focus, focus, focus. Mm hmm. The rest will come like get rid of the riffraff. And so for, for us, given the fact that we are health ecosystem oriented, everything that we do is geared towards building leadership capabilities within the health ecosystem. So you're right, Jeff, we have to have credibility with the clients that we work with. My advice to coaches would be choose either a practice area Am I going to be expert in high potential coaching? Am I going to put my stake in the ground around team coaching or team development? Choose a practice area or choose an industry and get deep in one or the other or both, and then build your brand in those either services or industries, because the field of coaching is very crowded. And so you'll have to create, you'll have to carve out what resonates for you. What, what are you passionate about? You know, it's a lot of work. So you want to do something where you really feel a connection to either the industry slash audience or the practice area that you're, that you're focusing on. Yeah, beautifully said. I think that you're, you're talking about the intersection between a particular practice area, so getting focused, and then also something that you're interested in. Because I, I remember, um, 
you know, I've over the years been a rather eclectic coach, I have to say, and I've been lucky to uh, be able to fool enough people that they let me into all sorts of different industries. <laughs> you're, you're amazing. And I'll tell you why in a minute, but keep going. <laughs> but I will say that, you know, when I first started working in healthcare, and part of that was due to my partnership with you, I think it was really important for me to recognize how much I enjoyed working with physicians because not everyone does. They are not an easy population. No. Nope. Now there are a lot of, you know, investment bankers are not always easy, software engineers are not always easy. So it's not like one is, you know, much more difficult than the other, but I personally loved working with physicians because they would always keep me on my toes. Like I would always walk out of the room with a team of coaches, a group or an individual and think, oh boy, I better go home and look that up because I need to know a little bit more about that. They kept me learning. They kept me curious. And so that I think is a really important component of what you're pointing to is choose a focus area, choose one that has a lot of growth potential. Clearly healthcare does but there's a lot of others. And then choose one that where your passion is aligned. Where your passion is aligned. And then you can build your marketing strategies around that work, right? Because it gives you something to say that is targeted in a field that's very crowded. So that's that's how it plays into, it's, it's sort of the yin and the yang. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Like, you know, do you build expertise in a particular industry? Um, do you start your, you know, marketing strategy on that industry? You know, what comes first? You do bo both at the same time and you see what sticks. And stay in true with your heart, because at the end of the day, if you put a lot of energy into something that has a lot of potential, maybe in terms of business to business opportunities, but it's not something that really interests you personally. It will eventually come back to bite you. A thousand percent. You know, when our team was revising our mission, vision, and values, um, this was a couple of years ago, one of the things that stood out to us was the connection between our mission, vision, and values and those of the client organizations that we serve. It, you know, there is this connection point around most healthcare organizations, whether you're a hospital, a payer organization, or a pharmaceutical company, it's really about doing what's best for the patient and our, or, or consumer, and our, you know, mission, vision, and values is all about doing what's best for the client. And our clients, we see as both the organization that we serve and the faculty that we bring in to deliver the services. So there's a kind of nice, we have, we have two sets of clients and we have to make sure that we're constantly building the bridge between the two. That's really our our role. Yeah, I love that because you're actually demonstrating in your in the way you're articulating it what I would call servant leadership, which is being a steward of your values, your vision and your passion for the customer, but also recognizing that those that you work with, in this case coaches, trainers, facilitators, that they are part of the ecosystem and they you want to have the same vision, the same values and the same commitment to them. A thousand percent, which brings me back to kind of the high touch part of what we're known for. Um, so we're high touch not only on the client side, but we're also high touch on the faculty side. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've been successful in bringing in such incredible talent, including you, Jeff, and many of your colleagues from the IOC and beyond. I think it's because, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, we, we do a lot of handholding. We want to make sure that you understand the clients that we're bringing you into. We want to make sure that you understand why you've been chosen because of your area of expertise for this particular client and the support that we provide um, to you and other members of TLD Group's faculty to be a part of our, you know, our family. Um, whether it's through communities of practice that we offer or, you know, discounts on training and accreditation for certain assessment tools, et cetera. We try to provide, you know, a service to our to our folks that are a part of the family. No, I think, and it's very evident. I mean, having met not only you, but a lot of the colleagues and the folks that you have as part of your team, I can speak to it from experience. One of the things that makes your firm unique, and one of the reasons I wanted to interview you is that when you built your brand, you've over time evolved from focusing on just physicians and just healthcare leaders to actually, I think what you would call an ecosystem of healthcare. And what I think is really special about that and worth listening 
um, to more about how that evolved from the perspective of any coach who's out there listening to this podcast is that I think it represents the future. We as coaches, as you said, there's a lot of us out there now. What you are already doing, I think, is something that many coaches, especially ones who would like to be creating and growing a firm around coaching and development, is thinking bigger than just a bunch of individual doctors or a bunch of individual nurses. So you're thinking about it in terms of an ecosystem. So say how that evolved in your mind, because I think it's actually very impressive and very forward thinking and helpful you know, for anyone, not just in healthcare, but if I were in the high tech space, I'd want to be thinking about the ecosystem of technology. Thank you. Well, the theory of um, health ecosystem leadership was something that we developed on recommendation of our advisory board some 10 years ago. And there was this kind of like, aha, of course it's obvious now, but there was an aha that we were really in a, a unique position in that we were doing work, intimate work with clients from the various sectors of healthcare. And, and so I know it seems natural now, the terminology health ecosystem, but back then it was like organic chem, uh, you know, terminology that's coming from a, you know, university professor, but no, it was, it was like, okay, there's a system in place. And if all parts of the system can work together, we can actually change the trajectory of healthcare in the, in the countries in which we're doing business. The idea was, let's start thinking about what are the leadership capabilities that individual mm -hmm. leaders need in order to start thinking that way, thinking like a collaborative leadership, thinking in terms of partnerships, thinking about diverse perspectives and pulling people together that they don't necessarily know yet, but they play a role in ultimately the vision of promoting health and wellness. So that's where the theory of health ecosystem and the competency model that we developed came from. So we started to do some research and we think about it at like an accordion. So at the individual client level, we talk about it. So if you're dealing with a health system, it's sort of like, okay, so what do you individual leader within a department need to be thinking about cross department in order to be effective in executing the strategy? And then we think about it within the sector. So what do you hospital president here need to be thinking about in terms of the other hospitals either within your system or outside your system. And then as an ecosystem, what do you leader within a pharmaceutical company need to be thinking about in terms of collaborating for health and wellness with your hospital systems in your area? So it's kind of like raising the bar on the mindset and it requires, you know, coaching to have people think differently. Um, we started to do a program. Um, so this is from a sales and business development perspective. We, we opened up a, we, we did an open enrollment program, which was the first for our business that we call the health, uh, the Institute of Health Ecosystem Leadership. And we invited leaders from various sectors to come together where we were teaching these skills and we did it like an academy. So we had some training and we did a bit of individual coaching and then we had some project work that we were doing. And it was such a great opportunity. We had the best time doing it. But here as a business owner, I had to make a decision because it it was a very big effort on our part to pull this off. And it, was, it wasn't it was quite ready for prime time. So it, what I mean by that is we weren't getting enough participants to want to really do this work. Is that because it was too new for people to really get wrapped their, their minds around? Uh... I mean, if you ask the participants of which we had 25, um, they would say, no, they were ready for it. I think I think the issue is who's going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for the program? I don't know that the leaders within the individual organizations quite understand it yet. They're focused very myopically on doing the work of their organization, and they don't necessarily see. I was I was hoping like we'd have a bestseller on our hands with my book and everybody would be reading it, but they don't necessarily see the perspective that I wrote about in the book, which is this cross-sector collaboration. I'm cautiously optimistic that in due time, things will turn around. Well, it, it's it's almost an, a necessity, right? That people ultimately have to wake up and see themselves as part of a broader system. A thousand percent. And I mean, I would have to say that you maybe you're a bit ahead of the curve. You know, that's an interesting question for you to reflect on as an entrepreneur, because 
that's always the challenge when you're trying to find the sweet spot, when you can bring in revenue, you can grow a business, you can bring make your coaches get paid and your staff, and at the same time, sort of push the envelope, right, for your clients. And because you're, you're thinking ahead. I mean, this idea of being an eco, part of an ecosystem, personally, I find it very refreshing. And I also find it futuristic. I really think that all leaders, if they're going to be ultimately successful within the broader ecosystem in which they operate, are going to have to start to think bigger than just what's in my silo or what's in my company. They're going to have to do that. The question is when. Jeff, I couldn't agree with you more. You and I are 100% aligned on this. And one of the strategies that we put in place for the end of this year is we're putting together an alumni network. So all of our former clients, we want to invite them to what we're calling um, a Helm alumni panel. So we would be bringing people together and it would be you know free of charge, but we want people to be starting to speak to one another. So we'll have leaders from various different client organizations coming together and we would have like a peer-to-peer networking around what it is that you do, what do I do? Oh, well, what can we do together? And we have lots of different associations and they're very industry specific. They're not cross-sector. So we have to start thinking more cross-sector. That's that's my big hope and dream. I totally agree. I, I mean, you're reminding me of the Many conversations I've had at the Institute of Coaching with Margaret Moore and Carol Kaufman, the founders, around how to integrate leadership coaching with health and wellness coaching and why are they considered separate? Why were they siloed in the first place? Don't leaders need to be worried about health and wellness? And aren't health and wellness practices key to the success of leaders? It's like that integration has become more the norm. You know, leaders are recognizing that taking care of themselves, taking care of their people is a um, key to their success. It's a critical success factor. So we are moving in the right direction. I totally agree. So that's sort of like the, <laughs> the hidden gem of COVID is that there is this focus. I, I can't even say renewed because I think it's new. Uh, there's a new focus now on health and wellness. I mean, we, we in our industry see burnout as a huge issue. It's a huge challenge our organizations are facing. So a lot of our coaching, if you look at our data um, across all of our clients, um, the ability to um, balance like work-life balance, or we call it work-world balance really at this point, is a top trend in terms of development goals for our coaching clients. And the kind of firm that you run and the kind of data that you can collect with coaching, with training, with facilitating these dialogues is incredibly helpful to people out there who are trying to, you know, see what is the future, right? What is possible? Well, thanks to you and your and other faculty at TLD Group, we're able to collect this information through our our tracking system where we track the goals and we actually just presented it at IOC this past year. That's right. That's great. That right. yeah. came out of the different sectors. It was really interesting. It's um yeah, I, I mean I love doing the research. I'm a nerd at heart, so that's that's fun for me. That's why you can thrive in the healthcare space because it's just <laughs> There's a lot of them, a lot of us. The truth of the matter is physicians, nurses, allied health professionals, anyone that have kind of comes in with this like depth of expertise in clinical care, those I find those folks to be incredible coachees because they have such a thirst for knowledge. So to me, they're the greatest clients to be working with. Right. And maybe I'm biased, but and hopefully you feel that way now. I absolutely do. And that means that you're in the right niche. Let me just take advantage of your expertise and your years of experience in the coaching space and in the leadership development space and share with our listeners, you know, if they wanted to, you talked about choosing a focus, you talked talk, talked about the limits and opportunities in marketing. What would you say is key to being successful in today's changing marketplace? Here's what I would say. There's a lot of shiny bubbles everywhere. And so you can, you know, think you've got to go deep on artificial intelligence or you've got to like invest heavily in new technology and systems. I would say those are great as accoutrements, but you got to go back to the basics. If you want to run a successful practice, whether you're our sole provider or you want to open up a business like mine where you have multiple folks working with you, uh, you have to stay focused on relationships, building relationships. That's, when you do good, you will do well. So I, I think that's, you know, that's that's it for me. You know, we, we, we sort of, we dabble in lots of different things, but I'll tell you over the course of my now 16 years, 
90 percent of our business is all about relationships so at that ending note would you say there is any key to choosing the marketing focus does it matter whether you focus on particular social media or writing a book because you've done that as a close which would you choose for if you, if you were to focus on something knowing full well that you can't necessarily directly assign and you know our revenue to it but i mean is it social media that really matters or is it writing collateral is it blogging is it website is it getting on linkedin is it where, what do you think really does help these days yeah so i think the first thing to do is to identify your target market and identify who is who are you ultimately selling to so who's going to you know write the check look at their profile what do they read what do they like to do you know where what kind of conferences are they going to and then focus your marketing strategies to that and so that's why it's important to kind of get focused get laser beam focused on who your audience is what your industry is and what your area of expertise is and then all the marketing kind of goes to understanding what we call the persona, like who's the person that you're marketing to. Get that down and then and then everything will follow. If they're on LinkedIn, then do your blog posting and put them on LinkedIn or try to connect through the invite connections on your LinkedIn. If they go to industry conferences, try to you know go or even propose to speak at that industry conference. And then you can go to the conference, meet people, shake some hands, do research with your clients publish with your clients like real success stories so that you can get the word out about the your your success stories. I completely agree. You're reminding me of the day that one of my clients at Duke Anesthesia asked me to come and facilitate a strategy offsite for what did he call it? Echocardiography and anesthesia and I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> but I knew to do two things. One, to do my homework on what etio, echocardiography was so that when I got up in front of the room to facilitate the discussion, I wasn't completely um, lost, even though I would never be an expert in it. And number two, I was just honored that they were looking into the subjects in such depth that they wanted to have a collateral, you know, a collaborative discussion around it. And I think that's exactly what you're pointing to. It's like, we need to follow what the client looks into. And that will probably make our answer actually relatively easy rather than confusing. A thousand percent. A thousand percent. Well said, Jeff. Yeah. Well, listen, it's been such a pleasure to have you on our podcast. I want to thank you so much for taking the time. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Hopefully you found it valuable to hear Tracy's journey to success. And if you're not a member of the Institute of Coaching, please consider going to our website, instituteofcoaching.org, sign up. There are, it's only $15 a month to be an affiliate member, and there's an amazing amount of resources. You would never be able to get through all the articles, journals, webinars, but it's a lifelong journey of learning, and um, we hope you'll join us. And we'll see you again next time for our next installment of Journey to Success. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye for now. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for listening to this episode of Coaching Revealed, brought to you by the Institute of Coaching. You can learn more about the Institute on our website at instituteofcoaching.org. You can stay up to date with new episodes of our podcast by liking and following Coaching Revealed. You can also find us on social media on LinkedIn, Instagram, and X with the handle Institute of Coaching. We also love hearing from our guests, so please reach out to us with thoughts you have on this episode and any questions you have about coaching. Until next time, this is Emily Tarani with Coaching Revealed.